Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I trust you can hear me. Uh, my name is John Dales, um, as it says on the slide here, and it's my pleasure to um, uh, introduce this webinar today. Um, thank you very much for joining. Um, it's arose from an idea that I pitched uh, to, well, no, I didn't really pitch, I just said, I think we need to talk about side streets to some colleagues from Landor um, a few months ago uh, when I was in Coventry. And uh, we didn't know that there would be almost 1,200 signups uh, for this. Um, I see that about, well, 600 and more of you are here right now, which is quite extraordinary. And um, it shows how much interest there is in this topic. Looking at some of the questions and issues that some of you have raised beforehand in signing up for this, um, it's clear that there's a, a wide variety of different perspectives on this, or rather different interests and different things that uh, delegates will be trying to find out and learn. And I hope we can introduce uh, you to a lot of, uh, or a direction to, to see some of the answers in that. Interesting, especially that some of the, some of you who ask questions have asked specifically about continuous footway crossings and continuous cycle crossings and so forth. Just to be clear that we're talking about side street crossings today. Um, and um, and that's, that will include, so are we talking about continuous footway crossings? Yes, we are. Are we gonna be talking about simple zebra crossings? Yes, we are. But are we just going to be talking about some basic changes that we need at side streets? Oh, yes, we are. Because I think one of the key issues that I imagine lots of you have signed up to listen to this for is just the fact that, uh, as we see yeah, in everyday life, side street crossings are, are, are frankly not fit for purpose for specifically people walking, wheeling um, and cycling across um, my interest in this is because of Movement, the company that I help run, um, designs streets, and we are very much focused on enabling uh, people to walk, wheel, and cycle much more than they currently do, and the uh, in, in, insufficiency, as it were, of the current infrastructure we've got is um, is a great uh, is a is a major part of that. Um, so. What we've got today is a couple of things to say really about this is we've got a great panel, we've got almost no time. So we've got 90 minutes. Um, I'll be followed after a, a few introductory slides um, by Brian Deegan from Active Travel England. Bharti Gupta from TRL is going to talk about um, some research on some simple crossings that were put in in Cardiff. Uh, Jonathan Flower uh, from uh, uh, University of Western England is gonna talk about some research they've done looking at um, user what happens at um, side street crossings uh, uh, with a little bit more of an emphasis on cycling there as well, as opposed to just the zebras. Chris Proctor from Waltham Forest is going to be talking about their experience with in implementing um, continuous crossings and other uh, crossing uh, changes in the last few years as part of their live, work, enjoy um, uh, Waltham Forest Mini Holland uh, um, uh, initiative. Robert Wheatman will be talking about some research that Living Streets have been doing uh, in the last uh, over the last couple of years, looking at uh, continuous footways and continuous crossings. And Daisy um, Narayanan from Edinburgh will be just talking about her take um, as uh, uh, somebody responsible in a big city like that for enabling people to walk, wheel, and cycle more than they currently do. Um, there will be the minimum number of introductions uh, between. All of these, we're just going to cram it in as quickly as possible. I will do a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, just to be clear, there aren't any direct user groups directly um, represented in some of our speakers today, but the perspective of user group, different walking, wheeling, cycling user groups will be up front and central in some of the presentations, including mine, which will come first. Um, and the second thing to say is that uh, because there are so many people signed up today and because we've got so little time, we're going to be really rattling along. We won't have introductions other than the very briefest things between the different presentations. Each of those will be relatively short, about seven minutes we're going for. There won't be time for clarification questions in between. And um, uh, and what we're hoping to do is that we'll have set, uh, 30 minutes of Q&A at the end, if we get through all these presentations as we, as we hope we will in that sort of time. And what I'm going to do, I will then pitch specific questions to specific speakers. Um, some of the questions that I've just mentioned have been already asked, and I've had a look at some of those. Um, down below in your screen, you'll be able to see there's a Q&A box. There's a chat box, which is disabled for general participants today. That's just for us to be able to talk amongst ourselves while we're going on. Within the Q&A, that's where you can add your own questions. 
and I would encourage you to be them to be as pithy as possible. And if you want to address them to a specific speaker arising from what you've heard them say or what you think they might say, uh, then drop them into the Q&A. We'll be looking at those and I will pitch, be pitching them to specific speakers at the end. Um, just to be clear, um, there's, we won't be handing the mic to any of you today. We just don't have the time or the ability to do that. Um, uh, the, the overall, the purpose of today's event is to inform you as much as possible about research, um, current research practice and thinking in this area to enable you to engage with that. Quite a few re research reports will be referred to and there'll be links to that and the information that, you, uh, that, that, that will be provided afterwards. There's going to be a recording of this whole thing. Um, and so... <laughs> um, you'll be able to see that they uh, land or hope to be able to, to circulate that recording of everything at the uh, by the end of the day if not it'll be shortly after that and that will include some of these links as well and just to say you saw a slide at the very beginning there's going to be an in-person conference in London in March uh, focusing uh, on these and other related issues looking at crossings and junctions um, and there'll be a slide popping up um, halfway through this presentation between uh, a couple of others, um, just to allow you to get some more information about that. And in fact, I think there's a QR code you can use and, and a discount code you can use for that as well, if you'd like to do so. So I'm going to start uh, by just giving a little bit of an introduction to this. And by doing that, I will share a screen in the old fashioned way. Um, and uh, here's hoping that this goes reasonably well. I reckon you can see this, um, and I'm hoping you can. Um, and I just want to talk through as an introductory thing, my take on essentially what I was talking about back in the day. Um, thanks for those thumbs up um, uh, uh, with colleagues about the fact that we, we have a problem with side street junctions. In fact, I think it's fair to say we have problems with side street junctions. Um, and this is my sort of assessment of, of what some of those generic problems are and what I call the Bellmouth factor, which is basically where you've got a relatively narrow side street and suddenly it splays to twice, sometimes three times its width when it comes to the crossing point. And that means that desire line crossing distances are necessarily large. It also means that because of the generous turn radii, drivers can turn in and out much faster than they otherwise could or should. And the, the, the consequence of both of those factors put together is that people crossing, whether they're walking, wheeling or cycling, are exposed to a greater than necessary danger for longer than necessary. It's a real classic double whammy. You're in the carriageway for longer and vehicles can go faster uh, through that space where you are. In addition to that, we have a real problem in terms of level access and whether that's through raised tables or properly formed drop curbs, that's routinely absent. Um, tactile signals are also routinely absent, so if you are uh, blind or partially sighted, there's just no indication before you get there um, uh, that, that there is a crossing to be navigated. This includes where there are, where there is level access as well, which makes it a little bit more tricky, obviously, because there isn't even a curb um, uh, upstand that you can that you can find. And I will say as well that despite recent, and if you look at them in detail, um, uh, rules H. 2 and 8 and rule 170, they are slightly confusing as to exactly how does this work out. Theoretically now, if you read the new highway code, and of course the vast majority of drivers have not, um, you're sort of expected to yield to people crossing or waiting to cross. Um, but then actually the rule 170 still in, sort of implies no, actually just when they started to cross. So even those changes, if anyone's read them, are relatively confusing. And so in summary, we've got a situation where the vast majority of side street junctions in this country do not prioritise the movement of people walking, wheeling or cycling. And, and I suppose I would just add that the problems are so common that they're hidden in plain sight. Um, and just by way of illustration of that, I happen to be in Edinburgh uh, for New Year's this year and on New Year's morning, I because I I do this and it wasn't just to clear my head, it was a lovely day actually. I just took a little walk around, literally a mile and a half around where I was staying in Edinburgh. And um, and I, I'm just gonna see what I saw and I'll chase through these as quickly as possible just to give an illustration of some of the bad, but also some of the good. And Daisy, just to be clear about this, I just happened to be in Edinburgh. Um, I could have taken, a, a and, I, and I have done frankly, because I am that sad, taken a similar range of photographs in virtually any city I've been to. So here's one in a really um, uh, quiet, dead end uh, housing estate where I was saying, a massive bell mouth for a tiny little junction where only three cars go. Um, uh, there's There are drops off the desire line 
um, and no tactile paving that goes with that or at all. It's just unnecessarily wide and 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 uh, problematic. Here's another one uh, just a little bit further up before I get out of the housing state, a similarly wide junction with drops actually on the desire line. But if you look in detail, the upstand there on the drop is um, is too great. Uh, that's you know a couple of uh, couple of two, 20 mil or so like that, which can be a real problem for people with rollators and small wheeled uh, wheelchairs and that kind of thing as well. Just poorly formed stuff. Um, just as we're leaving that estate, I, I like this one here coming onto the main road here. And these hash markings are just showing exactly what we could do, which is basically, look, that ju that junction is far too widely splayed. Uh, let's tighten it up. Now, that's a cheap way of doing it, but of course, vehicles can't overrun those hatch markings. And really what we need to do is to make that physical. Um, just moving along slightly, there was, a, an, an, again, another side to junction on that same made road, which is so wide they've split it in half, which is OK. You can do it in two parts, but that means you've got two sets of drop crossings now. And as you can see, it's rather pinched and uh, confused and the, the, the drop crossings aren't terribly well formed and the radii is still fairly generous. Moving along, there was just this very small um, side street junction there, but as you can see, you can't go across it in a, in a desire line. You have to go off your desire line quite a long distance to cross it. And on one side, as you can see, top right, really, really awkward and, and, and you know, badly pitched uh, tactile paving at the crossing there. And again, the upstand is too great and the junction crossing is too wide. Here again, further on, we've got another junction where the hatching uh, is shows where actually the curb line should now be uh, for that. Again, very quiet side street crossing. Here's one I thought was quite interesting, which is just basically a domestic driveway. And we have that here. And as I think you can see, if you uh, are using wheels, if you're in a wheelchair, you simply can't proceed across that because the upstand on one side is, is really quite substantial and poorly formed. In the, and that's just a domestic driveway. Uh, moving along slightly, we have another one, which is basically uh, just a fairly standard crossing, but, uh, you know, too standard, it's too wide. Certainly the radius on one side is far too big. There are no crossing points formed at all. There are no tactile paving or anything. I keep going down here. Now this is much better. It's a really kind of awkward junction, as you can possibly make out. But the council has come along relatively recently and built it out. So this is like the build outs you can see here are where they might have been hatching in the past. And that means, as you can see, those people crossing, there's far less um, distance to cross and uh, the, 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 um, the drop curves are properly formed uh, and on the desire line. Nice work. Uh, further on down, just an ordinary side street junction here where, again, there's no drops at all and there are no tactile paving, which is probably understandable if there are no drops. Another junction, much bigger one um, in side street there, and you can see that both of the corners there have been substantial build outs to make it easier with a central crossing uh, island where you don't have to go up and down, which helps as well. Um, uh, which is good. So you can go through that again, way, way better than it used to be. Uh, Opposite that, uh, there's a little junction here where they've got some little build outs, which means the um, the radii were never that tight, but they're built out. And actually, that's even less of distance to cross um, and drop curbs there uh, with tactile paving, which is better. Also, notice also the uh, the stop signs, which they seem to like quite a lot in, in, in Glasgow. You might expect in most places that would just be give way. Um, further down the way, you've got a junction here again where there's been a substantial build out. Uh, which is great to tighten up, but on one side, not on the other, interestingly enough, as you can see top right there, which means you, again, you've got an awkwardly formed and necessarily um, a crossing, a drop crossing on a wide radius. Um, here's another one. I'm just showing this is a very, very small uh, junction. That's just to a, a small, a couple of garages off to the right there. And this is one of the generic problems we have if we're going to drop our curbs is that it's, you know, You'll see this time and time and time and time again. It's 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 hard if you're doing it cheaply to get the the drainage right. And this kind of experience at the bottom of rock curbs is is, is far too common. Um, uh, I will. Uh, I think this is probably my, my last one, and this is my favourite in a way, which is another big, wide splay junction. Uh, we're back on the main road I was crossing originally, and it's just this big. Um, a, a huge area that has been reclaimed. And this is, I suppose, your halfway house between hatching it and actually building it out properly is to hatch it and then put some uh, ones there so that vehicles have to track 
in the appropriate way. I rather like that. It shows, I suppose, just another example of the kind of things we're dealing with. That's me really for the moment. That's just an introduction to the kind of problems we have and some of the solutions that uh, Edinburgh have put in. Um, um, just a quick look at that. That's what it used to be, uh, that same junction, and that's what it is now. Uh, not exactly pretty, uh, but uh, uh, but effective um, in, in, in the way that it works. And you'll see also it, uh, it enables um, cyclists on that cycle track as well, to, to people on cycles to, to, to get across much more safely than they otherwise would have done. I'm going to um, drop my screen now. And, um, oh, it's been dropped for me. And uh, all I it saves me to do, I'm going to introduce my uh, my friend, former colleague, and, and our head of inspections at um, Active Travel England, Brian Dean. And uh, I'll um, get out of your way, Brian. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I'll jump in on on side street crossings, or we move to the next slide because I'll I'll crack on quickly. Really about priority junctions, as uh, we engineers call them. So you already mentioned Highway Code Rule One Hundred and Seventy, which is does say to drivers the instruction is you have to give way to pedestrians crossing or waiting to cross so to an extent that's uh the mic drop job done why aren't people doing it um the the general rule then is that pedestrians do have priority the the interesting side of it is then we don't have to mark the general rule and this thing this is where some of the ambiguity comes in um whereas like a there's no marking we can do to tell drivers that pedestrians have priority because it's the general rule. So uh, another example would be like there's no uh, sign we can put up telling cyclists not to ride on the footway because the general rule is you can't ride on the footway. So the, the priority is established in the highway code. And, and here's the picture of it. And I thought I'd, uh, I'd start with this from, from the highway code. It was like, does it feel like the pedestrian has priority there? <laughs> I think if we put ourselves into the picture of that lady crossing, it's uh, it's it's quite a nervous place to be. I certainly, if I was walking with my children, would not just be staring ahead going, it's okay, I can do this. I'd be really worried about that driver, and I'd be worried about their approach speed, and I'd be really worried, and I'd probably get a little bit of a jog on to get across there. So the, the real crux of the matter is that priority is really not being established in the minds of drivers even though from a government point of view, and I'm representing the government here, we made it fairly clear, I think, in the guidance that they do have it, but do we need to do more to let drivers know, hey, there's this priority, but we would, in fact, be breaking our general rule rule about signage. Okay, let's move on to the next picture. We'll try and uh, unpack it a little bit further. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of like uh, the way people are crossing side roads, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Active Travel England tools this is like a, a successful method that I've employed myself. Headphones on, just go for it. Um, like our commissioner, Chris Boardman, used to talk about that crossing a side street shouldn't require bravery. And to an extent, we've created a situation where it does. Now, we might have that legal priority, but in reality, the only way you're really getting across town is to head down and go for it, which is good if you're bold, uh, if you're the kind of Richard Ashcroft style walker, all good. But for people who actually care about their lives and their children, it can be quite an intimidating place to do. And I think the whole essence of today is to try and unpack some ways of resolving it. Um, in the Active Travel England tools, which are shortly to be published, and we've been using for the last couple of years with local authorities, uh, we're, this is the number one issue for us. It's right at the top of the checklist of safety issues. How many vehicles are turning across the path of pedestrians or cyclists uh, going across side roads? I've put the figures there, which we think this is a major problem that greater than 2,500 vehicles per day. We're probably expecting fairly regular collisions and sadly fatalities. What can we do to avoid that? Can we treat it so that that priority is more clearly established? I want to show some methods of doing that. So uh, we really can't expect people to have to go around like this. What can we do to uh, make it better? Let's have a look at the next slide. So we're like... Uh, LTM 120, like the government guidance for cycling that came out a couple of years ago now, has a whole bunch of side street arrangements and uh, and it's quite good. It's got like uh, the kind of rate table, the the setback with uh, priority zebras, those ones on the top, the, the side road entry treatment with like inline or setback cycling ones or the continuous footways at the bottom. So we put those options. There is a missing top right. And I'll, I'll talk about that and show some examples that I think we have got examples of the inline parallel crossing, 
But this is kind of like a, when we're checking at ATE, Active Travel England, and schemes cross across our desk, we're kind of expecting them to conform to, to one of these. But are they all right? And there's certainly a lot of detail missing in these drawings, which are really like a schematic approach of you can do this, 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 and this. Can you try one of them? But there are many factors that come in to keep bell mouths wide and to stop people raising things and the cost and the expense and the maintenance and the drainage. All these other factors have to take in, in hand. Let's look at the next slide. So what we're doing at the moment is kind of deciding um, about side roads, zebras. And there's going to be people talking a little bit more about that. I'll uh, do this as a bit of an intro for, for the Transport Research Laboratory. It's certainly something that we're really interested in government as we think it, it could be a solution that fits in a lot of places. And really, this slide's about saying it, which I always say for anybody that talks to me, is like context is everything. There's no one solution to this. There'll be many different solutions that work in different contexts. I've had a go for Londoners will reckon, recognise the street types, but it's just looking at that kind of movement and place access that something you do in an arterial road should obviously be different to something you do in like a, a city place where there aren't as many cars and there's lots more activities and people moving everywhere. And like, you'd probably want to make it a very clear priority there. Whereas like a will priority ever be given to someone crossing an arterial road and what can we do to actually make that happen? Do we actually need to look at more like a signal options? So it's uh, it's my classic, like everybody's right and everybody's wrong given the context. So what a what I've attempted to do here is just show a little bit of a hierarchy of what crossings would provide the highest level of service for people walking and cycling in these different contexts. It's also like a more standard approaches as well. Um, so yeah, you can see there that we've got like inline parallel crossings, the continuous footways coming on those kind of city streets, but they are usable across a few more areas. But I do um, hope everybody watching this will think, okay, Continuous footways, we're convinced. Side road zebras, we're convinced. We'll pressure the government. But also think, well, where would they work? Where wouldn't they work? And the stage right in government at the moment is to kind of decide if we do do these things, where do they fit in the crossing hierarchy? Are we using the right type of crossings for the right context? That's a check that Active Travel England do. Uh, certainly, if we're looking at any kind of zebra crossing and it's over 8,000 vehicles a day, we're probably thinking it's very unlikely that priority will be given in that situation, we might go a little bit strong, we might have to do signal options, or we might have to raise things and tighten it and really make drivers aware that this is a place where they do need to yield priority. Now, the general rule's still there, but we have to apply it and make people aware of it in different contexts, in different ways. And that's really what this slide's about. And yeah, like that big circles around, well, actually, the side of the zebra that the rest of the world uses, uh, this kind of simple zebra, as John referred to it, is quite applicable in a lot more scenarios than the other options that we have. And it's also one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest option that we could do in there, which is always good in a strained economy where we want to make changes quickly to get more people uh, walking, wheeling, cycling. And particularly that's the whole aim of Active Travel England. So we've got a cheap solution that we can roll out en masse, then uh, uh, we're definitely open to that. And we are looking at that at the moment. And I'll come back to that as well. Let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, I've come back to it right now. Side road zebras. I've talked a little bit about like the stage we're at. Like I said, is that we're thinking where do these fit in the hierarchy? What's the exact spec? And active traveling, we've been supporting the Welsh government who are a little bit further ahead than us because they're they're into a kind of a, a regulation cycle at the moment. We're, we're waiting to update the next uh, round of the traffic signs regulations and general directions document, the TSRGD as we all call it, we can't really put any new marking or use a prescribed marking in a different way until that document's come out. We are, for those that have been keeping uh, keeping clock, you know, about 10 years overdue an update of the last one, or it, sometimes we do, uh, uh, do temporary fixes during that period. So we are due that to be updated, and when that does update it, we very much want to put some different markings, and we're, we're really excited about the research that uh, Great Manchester have done and that that uh, the Welsh government have done. You'll hear more about that in a moment. It does seem to be a fairly compelling case to use this. We still have that conflict in our minds at the government that actually the general rule is that pedestrians have priority. Why aren't people doing it? Is there more of a behaviour change option? But I think we've uh, all rested on the fact that these things do seem to be cementing that 
into drivers' minds. But we do always have to think, well, will drivers just think that pedestrians have only got priority of this markings here? What happens if it's not there? Does that weaken the general rule? These are the kind of questions that we have to face as uh, as legislators and regulators at government. But I'd uh, just point this one out. This is uh, from Greater Manchester, a visualisation. I could have shown many, many real ones that people have done of this kind of lighter style, but this was a visualisation that we originally done in Greater Manchester. And I got them to do it on my street in, uh, in Moss Side. And uh, just that it's a different conference, but we did have to Photoshop all the vehicles off the... Uh, off the footway so you can actually show that people could walk there but that's one for another topic let's move on to the next slide okay so um Brian, if you could just show... uh, wrap up oh, my... that would be great oh yeah i've only got like a couple of pictures i'll do them quickly sorry john john knows i famously go on a little bit so just a few examples of best practice and just to illustrate some of the uh, the different concepts here's an inline parallel crossing that missing top right from ltm 120 People have done it. John will know this one very well. A little bit of greening, uh, protection and priority, obvious priority for people walking and cycling. Uh, very, very much active traveling. We think this is best practice. Let's do the last one for a big finale, just to show uh, a really murky day. Uh, I thought I'd end on a rainy day in Romford by showing a continuous footway next to a cycle track as well as a little bit of an example. And hopefully as an apparity for the, uh, the following conversations. That's me done, John. Thanks. Lovely, thank you very much, Brian. Um, uh, yes, I'm no one to talk in terms of uh, taking longer than I should with doing. But uh, without further ado, um, partly um, included by the uh, Simple Zebras research, let's hear what Barty has got to say from her research looking at the work that Cardiff have done. Thanks, Barty. Hi, um, so uh, thanks, John. I'll be talking about uh, the study TRL did last year on the impact of uh, simple zebra crossings on road user behavior and perceptions and Cardiff. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit of background about the project. Uh, the Welsh government and Transport for Wales were delivering a new default uh, speed limit of 20 miles per hour on restricted roads in Wales. And as part of that rollout, um, the Welsh government commissioned TRL to take a trial of the simple uh, zebra crossings on side roads in Cardiff. And the main thing they wanted to understand was the impact of these crossings on road user behavior, uh, safety, and associated user perception. Um, next slide, please. So there's a couple of differences as uh, Brian actually uh, showed just now on what's a difference between a simple zebra crossing and a, a traditional zebra crossing. Um, as you can see, they both have the traditional black and white stripes across the road and the respective giveaway lines around it. However, unlike the traditional zebra crossing that has a minimum requirement of at least two zigzag lines um, that creates a minimum setback distance of about 4.8 meters, the simple zebra crossing is placed at the right at the mouth of the, of the junction and ideally where there's a dropped curb to stay within the desired walking line of a pedestrian. And it also does not have the zigzag markings leading up to the crossing and there are no Galicia beacons. So we use this for the trial. Um, and the study was approached in two parts. One was the impact study where we uh, looked at before, uh, we did a before and after monitoring of the site using data captured by object, object detection technology. And then we also approached road users using surveys to capture their feelings and attitudes towards the simple, uh, simple zebra crossing after it was installed. Next slide, please. So one of the key findings from the impact study was that more pedestrians uh, chose to take the direct route across the mouth of the junction with the simple zebra markings uh, in place than they had previously done so. And on the next slide, you will see that before the simple zebra crossing was implemented, there was a small portion of pedestrians that crossed the road after the vehicle. And the data showed that after the implementation of the simple uh, zebra crossings, there was a significant reduction in the number of pedestrians who gave uh, way to vehicles with the um, biggest reduction at one of the sites, the Bishop site. Uh, which was also the busiest of the three sites that were being trialed, suggesting that there could be value in adding simple zebra crossings at uh, busy junctions. Um, yeah, next slide, please. 
So on this, we look at the impact of uh, the simple zebra crossings on the distance between a vehicle and a pedestrian. So it would be expected that a pedestrian's uh, perception of safety would be affected by the proximity of vehicle, their uh, proximity from the vehicle that they uh, and their, themselves when they're crossing. And so the further away a vehicle is, the safer a pedestrian would feel about crossing at this crossing. And if you look at the dark gray bars on this chart, that shows that the number of pedestrians who cleared the crossing area before the vehicle reached uh, that point uh, was reduced. Um, and that, uh, sorry, the number of pedestrians who cleared the crossing increased after the zebra crossing was installed. And um, yeah, this uh, has implications for users' perception of safety as well. And then if you look at the next slide, you look at the vehicle speed as it approached the crossing. And the charts are basically presenting the distribution of speed at all three sites before and after the implementation. So you'll see that there's a clear shift uh, in the distribution of uh, speeds towards lower speeds, meaning that vehicles were generally approaching the crossing at lower speeds after the implementation um, of the simple crossing. Again, this has implications for users' perceptions of their safety. So if you go to the next slide, this is just a summary of um, all the other uh, parameters that we looked at. Overall, the research uh, conducted in this trial provide, provided strong uh, evidence that the simple zebra crossing achieved its objective in increasing pedestrian priority. And the, the observed reduction in speed vehicle, uh, vehicle speed, the proximity between the, the vehicle and the pedestrian at the crossing suggests that there's some safety benefits. And um, none of the observations that uh, we looked at also indicated any additional risk to road user, uh, road users' safety. Um, next slide, please. And looking at the survey findings from the user perception study, the majority of both pedestrians and drivers we approached reported that uh, pedestrians have priority using the crossing and that motor vehicles and cyclists must give way to pedestrians using the trial crossing. So, and, and when we spoke to the disability group, they also agreed uh, the same thing about the priority, but they did not feel confident that drivers would actually, uh, could actually be re relied upon to give way to pedestrian, especially when the junction is so close, uh, when the crossing is so close to the junction. So majority of the reasons for feeling safe were due to the presence of a crossing in the first place. And uh, reasons for feeling unsafe were that they didn't really uh, trust other road users to give them way. And as mentioned earlier, that because it's so close to the junction, it's something that's new. And during the trial, it also happened that uh, there were vehicles that were obstructing the view of the pedestrian um, at the curb. So that was another reason for the concerns. Um, and drivers, uh, when we asked drivers if they felt more or less safe with or without the crossing in place, uh, it had little difference on how drivers feel um, because of that. And finally, blind or partially sighted road users prefer to cross at a point away from the junction uh, because just simply because of how they navigate um, the road. Um, next slide, please. So the user survey raised some concerns that could be addressed through communication and education campaigns about the new markings uh, and changes in the recent highway code that gave greater priority uh, to pedestrians at side roads. And specifically considerations need to be given to the concerns raised by people with disabilities, specific, especially to ensure that the uh, side road crossings are free from obstructions and parked vehicles that crossings are only marked between parallel curbs to, this is specifically to allow visually impaired users to know where the start point is and where the end point is, and then also provide alternative crossing available away from the junction um, to allow them to, for those who do not prefer to cross at the junction. And lastly, uh, while the none of the observation indicated increased risk to road users, uh, this was only study was this study was only done for a two week period, 
uh, and longer term monitoring could be done um, for future trials, uh, as well as a few other parameters that, that were raised as concerns, basically, because the, the trial was done in the daytime. So implications of the trial uh, of the simple uh, zebra crossings on road user perception in the dark needs and also um, of observing the impact that simple crossings have on parking behavior at the curbs nearby. Um, that is me. Thanks. And I'll hand it back to you, John. Many thanks, Barty. Um, and from one research project uh, to another, um, let's hear from Jonathan Flower at, uh, from the University of the West of England. Thank you, John. Um, I, I'm going to present briefly this morning on um, findings from two recent studies. Um, the first was funded by Transport Scotland, and that looked specifically at design priority crossings. And the second was funded by the Road Safety Trust, and that was funded um, at the, that was looking at MART priority crossings. And I work for the Centre of Transport and, and Society, and we studied the effect of enhancing priority for people crossing side roads um, on foot or cycle traffic. Um, even um, even more important, I think you agree, following the um, January 2022 highway code changes that have been mentioned already. On this next slide, um, it's something that Brian's already showed um, from LTN 120, the diagram from LTN 120. And junctions, uh, as you can see here, may be enhanced by design improvements, um, marked here as design priority, also known as continuous footways or continuous crossings, or as you see at the top, um, by mode road markings um, marked here as marked priority. Now, LTN 120 suggests that the choice between marked priority and design priority depends on context and also on budget. Um, design priority, as um, Brian's already said, um, has typically been deployed with no setback of, of footway or cycle track whereas marked priority or parallel crossings with no setback are not currently possible or not currently permitted. We've seen that picture from um, Brian that um, there, are, uh, there are at least, uh, there is at least one example of, uh, but they're not cu currently permitted because of the regulation um, for a minimum of two zigzags each side of the crossing, hence the no box at the top right hand corner. On the next slide, I've put pictures of three junctions and um, we researched yielding behaviour at conventional side road junctions compared with design priority junctions and mark priority junctions. And yielding behaviour of people crossing the side roads um, in 13,402 interactions were coded. So we looked at junctions right across the, um, the UK. Um, and we coded those interactions at side roads as no yield, voluntary yield or forced yield. And nearly half, that's 46% of the interactions with turning vehicles for people crossing at conventional side road junctions um, in our observations were voluntary yields, um, where the person crossing defers to a, a turning driver. But when we look at enhanced junctions, they virtually eliminate voluntary yields and create a, um, high proportions of priority for people crossing. So looking at the bottom left-hand corner there, um, the overall no yield rate is 88% at marked um, priority with the zebra. Bottom right, it's 90% at design priority um, crossings. Um, and you can see in the middle there that the value of the zebra at marked priority junctions is demonstrated by a lower no yield rate of 65% when you come to marked priority without a zebra. On the next side, uh, considering safety, um, and we used the proportion of force yields by people crossing as a proxy for risk. Um, so risk to people crossing side roads as vehicles are turning in or out appears to be lowest um, at design priority and highest at mark priority without the zebras. However, it's worth bearing in mind that statistical modelling that we undertook shows that these proportions are influenced by both the crossing um, flow and the turning flows in and out of the junction. So on the next slide, uh, um, just considering the question to, to set back or, or not to set back. So that's the question. 
Um, and design priority junctions like the one you see on the left with no setback have a high proportion of occasions when the person crossing doesn't yield. Um, in our study, it was 91%. And this is lower um, with partial setback at 77%. False yields are, um, are low with no setback at 8% and higher with partial setback at 19%. Moving on to marked priority junctions with a parallel crossing and with partial setback like the one on the, the right. These have a high proportion of occasions when the person crossing doesn't yield at 92%. And this is higher than for full setback, um, which is 82%. Um, and there were very few voluntary yields. Um, there, there were more false yields with full setback at 18 percent than partial setback at 8 percent. And these proportions indicate a tendency for crossings with less setback to offer greater priority for people crossing the side roads. Now, this comes with a, a, a caveat. We, we did undertake statistical modelling. I'm not going to go into the details now. If you want to know, you can look at the, the, the report. Um, and the statistical modelling suggests that there is no difference in propensity for drivers to force yields based on level of setback. So what do we conclude? On the next slide, you can see that the findings uh, demonstrate the value of both design, um, design priority and mark priority junctions, uh, especially parallel crossings with the zebra in reinforcing priority for people crossing a side road um, and greater priority with less setback. Now, but, but before I, um, I conclude, I just want to do one sort of postscriptum. Um, and uh, on the last slide here, um, you can see uh, a simple zebra, and this is in Melbourne in, in Australia. Um, and in this city, they've been installing simple zebras like those, these um, that you can see here, are prioritized locations across the city um, to encourage or to enable walking and to improve safety. And unlike the UK, this is um, currently permitted under um, Victoria state, uh, state regulation. However, um, there is a risk that they can lead people to believe that at sites where they're not installed, um, drivers don't have, have to give way to a pedestrian, something that um, Brian alluded to, um, who is a pedestrian that's uh, crossing the street into which a driver is turning. And we undertook some um, research with the University of Melbourne and found that the risk of this unintended consequence um, is actually very, very real um, from these study findings. So I, I, I would end by saying that um, this is something that demands more research and has implications for, for both our findings um, and the research carried out by TRL um, in Manchester and Cardiff. So thanks very much. And these references here are, are ones that I think will be shared with you later. They will indeed. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, and just here's a word from our sponsors. Um, so uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, and as you might have seen as you were coming in uh, from the holding slide, there's a conference um, in London in March, which um, deals with, which will look in more detail at some of these issues. And I dare say there'll be some uh, familiar faces uh, that and uh, as well. Um, if you're interested in that, um, I tried the QR code earlier, it did work. And there's even a, I see, oh yeah, a discount code as well. So anyway, grab that. I'm sure that'll be provided in uh, in future information as well. If you wave your camera at that in the final few seconds, it's up, you can do that. Um, but we do need to be moving on now. And next up uh, with the practitioner's perspective, moving from research to that, We've got Chris Proctor from London Bars and Waltham Forest and um, because they've done a lot of work uh, in this field. So, uh, Chris, thank you very much. Thanks, John. Um, firstly, apologies for the hat. We are. I'm trying to try and save on, on heating and it's a balmy 15 degrees in here. Um, so I'm hoping everyone can see this. So very briefly, um, my name is Chris Proctor and for quite a while now, I've been providing a lot of support to Waltham Forest as part of their mini Holland programme and um, ongoing projects that try to main, keep keep applying some of those principles. Um, my presentation is really a whistle-stop tour of what has been done in Waltham Forest. It doesn't go too much into the, the why and the challenges we're trying to address. I think, John, you captured that at the beginning. Um, so we will crack through. So Waltham Forest, bit of background context. Uh, first 
two or three were introduced on Ho Street for those that know Waltham Forest, which is a main north south corridor in the centre of the borough in late 2014. Um, they were preceded by ones that John team worked on and delivered in Lambeth prior to that. But as far as I'm aware and we're aware, there aren't too many um, prior examples um, in the UK. So there's limited evidence and examples to draw upon. Um, so some of the principles largely came from Holland. Um, I believe there's a, a wider view that it's, it's North and Western Europe, but I, I was reliably informed the other day that it's mainly from Holland. So uh, in terms of how we kind of tried to embed it into Wolfram Forest uh, kind of policy and, and principles, it was integrated into the Mini Holland Design Guide. And I'm hoping that you, um, well, I'm not expecting everyone to be able to read the small text, but this is a, a, a screen grab from um, the design guide, which tries to kind of, you know, embed it in that policy so it's clear and, and you know, for everyone to, to appreciate. Um, the intention really is to obviously provide priority and continuity of provision for people walking and cycling at side road junctions. Um, John talked about, and Brian, the, the various rules and regulations within the Highway Code, um, trying to strengthen and reinforce those. Um, and I know there's a bit of a question mark about whether the change in 22 um, did strengthen them. I think so, but maybe there's that's a, a topic of debate. Um, it's really important to know that in terms of continuous footways, one for us to 99% of the time employed them as part of a wider package of measures, so integrated into a wider treatment, if you will. So that's either looking at kind of uh, segregated cycling and walking infrastructure on the on main roads or as part of kind of area based treatments, looking at traffic reduction schemes or low traffic neighbourhoods as the current parlance is. So as of today, there's over 200 in Waltham Forest um, dotted around mainly in the south and centre of the borough with a, a limited number um, in, in the north. Uh, there's a few different images of them, obviously, you know, kind of trying to depict the different scenarios. And I think the next slide kind of conveys the, the, the variations that we do have in the borough. Um, there's been a lot of trial and testing, design tweaks, trying to trial slightly different layouts and formats. I'm not quite sure we've got to the point where we have the exact preferred one. Um, and obviously every junction is different. So there's always needs to be um, some flexibility in approach. So in terms of design, um, you know, the variations are, are there, kind of, you know, whether you do or don't have a, a cycle track uh, running along the kind of main road, uh, whether the main road itself is raised locally, um, obviously that then, turn, you know, affects whether or not you can achieve vertical deflection into the side road, um, which obviously is, you know, some people will say is a key element and certainly part of the Dutch principles is, is, is slowing that, those turn movements in and out as far as possible. Um, and of course, we, with all schemes, we always try to reflect local kind of characteristics, public realm and other factors. And that obviously leads to some decisions maybe around materiality, layout. Um, and so particularly if you've got kind of urban designers involved and those public realm specialists who want to kind of try and bring that local characteristic into design. Um, whilst we do have quite a lot of variation, we do try to, or one of us have tried to stick some key principles. So that's generally removing all the kind of features that you would typically associate with a kind of side road junction. So that's your curbs, um, you know, street furniture as, as much practical road markings. And, you know, obviously the big one is obviously the, the um, kind of tactile paving. And, that, and that's a huge um, area of debate, obviously, in terms of the impact that may may have on, on certain users. Um, generally, the principle is to try and reduce the side road kind of width down as far as possible. So over the years, generally, we've kind of got down to about five, five and a half metres for most two way roads, um, obviously less for one way roads um, or um, one way roads where we're trying to accommodate two way cycling um, somewhere in the middle. Um, try to kind of reinforce that width restriction through street furniture, particularly green infrastructure, if we can, if there's scope to do that utility. So the photo here is a quite good example of, of trying to reduce that kind of side road width through through green infrastructure, which has obviously added benefits. <clears throat> And then kind of coming up with these kind of imaginary radii of one meter. And I've seen a lot of comments in the in the Q&A about refuse access and large vehicle access. But um, I think the view from Forest has been to really try and reduce those kind of effective radii to really slow movements in and out and kind of accept that may mean certain bigger vehicles have to make movements that overlap into the main road carriageway 
etc and yes on the speed reduction element um, where we can not always possible for you know engineering constraints or because you may have raised sections on the main carriageway vertical deflection wherever possible some of the key concerns that came up particularly during the first few years as as the first numbers were, were introduced in the borough um you know the impact on people with visual and cognitive difficulties um we had quite a lot of correspondence from parents um with children walking to school um obviously been taught traditional ways of how to navigate using those kind of common features that have always been there and, and the, you know the age-old kind of educational approach um so and obviously the continuous footway treatment kind of takes those away and so it was concerns over you know safety for, for younger members of society uh at certain locations uh, concerns around congestion delay from a driver perspective so uh two vehicles not being able to kind of pass in and out um, due to no, no lack of visual clues around road positioning. Um, did find that tends to be on locations where we had high residual flows, uh, as in most of the um, continuous footways that have been installed have been as part of low traffic neighbourhoods or other treatments that have sought to reduce traffic. But uh, there are a small number on roads where it was still reasonably high residual volumes, and they're the ones typically where the, the issues have arisen around um, vehicle behaviour and being able to pass one another. Um, also, some concerns about visibility for drivers because of the setback giveaway. So um, the images I previously showed weren't maybe the best ones to convey this, but most of the continuous footways have, you can just see in the bottom left hand corner here, um, giveaways that are, you know, if you're exiting the side road, that's where the driver should try and yield, um, obviously to then move cautiously and slowly across the kind of continuous footway area before exiting on the main road. Um, obviously, in a lot of London streets, you you know you don't ha you quite often don't have um, bill nine step very far back, and so those giveaways people have been raising concerns that you can't necessarily see um, the main road very clearly when you when you're quite far step back. Um, so yeah. Obviously, quite a few concerns, I believe, um, or I'll remember, in, in the first few years. But I would say that over time, as more have been rolled out in the borough, the number of concerns that I've certainly seen and heard of have reduced substantially and very here very few. That, that's directly from Wolfen Forest residents. <clears throat> I, I would say certainly that doesn't, um, I wouldn't suggest that means that they don't exist. Um, we have done some monitoring, albeit not for quite a long time. Um, it's been hyper local largely. And uh, yeah, I would say generally quite limited. We, we have kept on talking about wanting to do more and, and there's always quite often other priorities kind of get in the way um, of these things. And, and gladly there are some much more robust kind of studies and work being done that colleagues on, on this presentation have talked through and will talk through. So um, be obviously looking to kind of review those and see how we can apply them. Um, <clears throat> these are the studies we have done. So this was one that was done actually by TFL with us looking at two locations um, in Ho Street, so not the section that is on my very first slide. This is the northern end, which uh, was delivered in 2016, 20, 2016. Um, so yeah, so this was a bit of work just looking at before and after, a um, bit of conflict interaction analysis, um, and just kind of some kind of key points from that, that uh, kind of drivers assuming priority or, or the number of drivers giving away did appear to go up. Um, having you know put in these continuous footways obviously maybe not as much as would have liked um, but obviously these were very early days so some of the first that were installed in the borough um, and then obviously this particular location there were some movements more than others in terms of the vehicle movements in and out where driver priority changed more significantly or sorry pedestrian priority changed more significantly I think with this one it was the left turn in and the left turn out were ones where we didn't see as much change whereas the right turn in and out the the pedestrians saw a lot more priority after after the changes. Um, <clears throat> this is another one. So this was actually done by some consultants that uh, Warren Forest used, Project Centre. This is one of the junctions where we had quite high residual flows and there was lots of complaints here about vehicles not being able to kind of pass one another. Um, and that's because there was quite oft, quite a few occasions where you'd have vehicles trying to exit as well as others trying to, to get in. So we looked on this in two fronts. So again, we tried to look at the pedestrian vehicle interaction angle. Um, as well as looking at more of those kind of operational concerns about vehicles passing one another um, and whether vehicles are having to mount the curb, et cetera. So I appreciate you may not necessarily be able to kind of see all of these numbers in, in the presentation, but I believe that they'll be available. Again, this one showed from a pedestrian priority perspective that, um, you know, certainly pedestrians seem to get more priority. 
Uh, but then uh, the, the actual movements that they got more priority on were actually different to the ones on Ho Street, which is quite interesting. It did also highlight that there were some issues around vehicles being able to kind of get in and out. And as a result of this, some small adjustments were made to, to the junction just to try and relieve that a little bit. Uh, the final bit is really around um, some collision-based monitoring we did as part of our wider Walthamstow Village Review, which was the first kind of major scheme that was delivered on Mini Holland. Um, it was quite limited. It was trying to look at collisions before and after the scheme. So the post date was only 11 months, whereas clearly we would always look for three years, if not more. Um, it did indicate that there had been a reduction or significant reduction in collisions involving pedestrians and cycles at junctions where uh, continuous footways were introduced. But I would um, say that there's no way that you could really try and isolate that down to the continuous footway treatment itself. And there's obviously a huge range of factors would affect that. So. Um, hopefully, you know, a collision-based assessment is something that we can look at moving forward. So for us, or for Wolfram Forest, next steps is, um, and so colleagues coming up, we'll talk more about this. Um, obviously, there's some great research that's just come out from Living Streets, so we'll be looking to digest that and see how we can take the findings of that and um, look at maybe an internal design review and looking at our internal guidance and specification Wolfram Forest. And, you know, I'd like to see Wolfram Forest do some more local research and monitoring of our own infrastructure as well. So I will leave it there. So we'll get rid of this. Many thanks, Chris. Thanks a lot for that. And especially for teeing up Robert Wheatman from uh, Living Streets, who um, is just going to talk to us, doesn't have any slides. Well, you might have one. Thanks very much, Robert. Uh Thanks, John. Um, uh, so yes, um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not sharing slides. I do have one image I'll share later on. I, as 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 Chris has just said, I've spent the last two and a half and a years leading a Living Street study of continuous footways at side roads, and also of bus stops where there's a cycle track, and we've been investigating questions about how inclusive those arrangements are. But I'll focus today on some of what we've learned from the continuous footway work. And for anyone who's not sure what I mean when I talk about a continuous footway, stick with me because I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, I could only scratch the surface of what's in the report, so I'm going to work towards describing one central conclusion from the research that I think really matters for today. But just briefly to get started, I need to mention three introductory background points. Firstly, it was clear from the work that in Britain, there is no consistent widespread agreement around what a continuous footway is and is not. And there are contrasting and contradictory ideas and guidance documents and a very wide range of different designs actually on the streets, which are all being called continuous footways. Um, we could see that what that means is that everyone ends up talking at cross purposes and even, even some seemingly obvious things aren't well established. For example, many of the designs we studied, which were described as continuous footways, didn't unambiguously continue the footway, um, you know, the, the pavement. So, so we have infrastructure that people describe as being a continuous footway where the footway doesn't really properly continue, which obviously is confusing. Uh, what that means is that I know to offer everyone listening today a note of caution. So when I say continuous footway or someone else in this meeting uses the term or you think about a continuous footway, we might all be meaning something quite different from each other. Secondly, in this work, we, we thought both about continuous footways and about footway crossovers, both together as being tightly related to one another. And what, what I mean when I say footway crossover is what we're all familiar with at entrances to private driveways, private accesses, where the footway, the pavement continues, but it's possible to drive over the top of that for access. And for anyone who's got no idea of what I'm meaning when I talk about a continuous footway, that idea offers a good starting point. And, and that's something we're all used to as an idea, and we can easily debate where that's a good idea and what would make it a bad idea. And we saw our work on this as sticking, sitting in that context, looking at when it is and when it's not a good idea to continue a footway and, and when that works or fails for pedestrians and, and particularly around issues around inclusion. And then thirdly, thirdly, as an introductory point, in our work, we could see that what's currently being built and what's been called continuous footway quite often isn't providing the degree of priority to pedestrians, which we think people have been hoping for. And we think that has consequences, quite severe consequences around the accessibility of streets. 
So effectively, we are flagging up in our research that there is a problem that what people have, you know, the people are, are right to have been concerned about some of what's changing on their streets. But we've also been clear that the failure of some of what we've seen in, in the terms I've already expressed isn't proof that footways should never be continued over any spaces used for vehicle access. Um, so we've provided in the reports a whole set of recommendations looking at those questions. And that brings me to what the main points are I want to make today. Um, our recommendations include a set of important points about when it might work to continue a footway and when it probably won't work. For example, we have said that continuous footways probably require that vehicles are slowed to something like a walking speed. Uh, and we've said that they probably won't work in a safe and an inclusive manner if there are vehicles moving both in and out of a side road at the same time. And we've said they probably won't work well if there is a queue of exiting vehicles. And we've made clear that conditions on the main road must allow those driving to stop and wait comfortably without getting stressed that they're irritating other drivers behind them before they turn in. Um, but now that, that would rule out, in, in many ways, the use of continuous footways at most side road junctions in Britain just now. But, but the things I've just listed as issues, vehicle speeds and volume of traffic entering or leaving a side road, complex situations with cars and trucks and buses driving in and out of a side road all at the same time, queues of vehicles that pedestrians need to squeeze between, drivers turning into a side road who are worried about getting across a stream of oncoming traffic or who feel unable to stop before turning in case they irritate somebody behind them. Those things are going to be issues for any design in which we want pedestrians to be safe, but for, for any situation which we want to be inclusive. And, and that's what I really, really want to draw attention to today. Um, those things aren't about continuous footways particularly. Those things are going to make the difference in terms of real inclusion and real safety if a junction has, you know, even if a junction has a more conventional design. So if we are going to make our streets inclusive, uh, our side road junctions safe, then there will be no magic piece of infrastructure which will make a big difference on its own. For any changes to work, we are going to need to make big changes to how the whole system is working. If we are going to be comfortable, if, if we're going to be able to have a situation where a driver turning into a side road is going to feel comfortable giving way to a pedestrian crossing the side road or waiting to cross, then that requires a particular set of conditions on the main road. The whole main road has to be designed with that in mind. And if there's to be any hope of an inclusive and safe situation, then we can't have pedestrians faced with vehicles approaching at high speed along the side road or queuing to exit the side road while there are also people driving into it. And that means the whole design of the side road and the level of traffic it's carrying have to be right. So I'm going to leave you with an image which I'm sharing on my screen now, I hope. Uh, this is a wooden cube which has had icing put on top of it and a couple of birthday candles added. Um, for me, this is a way to illustrate what I think is one of the big risks when we think about side road junctions, which is that we end up talking about local details when we need to also be thinking about the wider system. So if you like getting tangled up in the need to be, uh, getting tangled up in discussing the, the color of icing on the cake or the arrangement of the candles, when the biggest problems are with what the cake is actually made of and whether that's edible or not. So we're faced with a key problem. We have lots and lots of side road junctions which are of a kind of middle status, not quiet enough or small enough to be trivial to cross for a pedestrian, but not busy enough to be one of the few places we're ever going to install traffic signals. We're only going to be able to install expensive things in a few places and whatever we come up with will only work where conditions are right. So before talking about specific designs or as part of thinking about specific designs, we're going to need to think about how the whole system is going to work so that the junctions we have, uh, you know, so that the designs we have avail available can be used and can be used appropriately. And so that the general system creates an environment in which pedestrians can have a, have a decent experience everywhere. And actually, in many places, we can redesign streets so that what is currently a side road junction is no longer a side road junction in, in that way anyway. Uh, so nothing about today can work in isolation. This is about having to reform how everything works. 
So just to finish, I'd like to encourage people to take a look at what we've written in, in the reports from Living Streets and how our findings in, in, in those point directly to those questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Robert. Yes, so the solution is to change everything. Um, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a thing. I'll come on to that later. But finally, for our presentation, we have Daisy. And Daisy, as you said, just feel free to crack on or even comment on what you've heard. Uh, you've got the, uh, the, the the final opportunity here. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's always great going last because I sometimes feel I should just say what they said and then just step away because every single slide, every single pre presenter has kind of summed up some of the issues that we're facing in Edinburgh and some of the challenges and, and opportunities as well. So I'd like to carry forward, I'll, I'll rattle through the slides. I'm conscious there's over a hundred, about a hundred questions in the chat. So I'm standing in between answering those questions in the conversation. Um, so I'll just rattle through my slides very quickly. I want to carry on the theme of what Robert's just said about a system change and stepping back and looking at how this conversation around side road zebras fits within the wider kind of discussion around change that is required, transformational change that's required within our cities and towns and places. So I'm Daisy Narayan and I have the immense privilege of working as the head of placemaking and mobility at the City of Edinburgh Council. And my job is to join the dots between transport and planning and to always step back and look at why, why are we doing this? And you know whether we're talking about the detailed designs uh, like side road zebras or baby crossings, or whether we're stepping back to look at what we call in Edinburgh, the circulation plan, which is looking at uh, you know network design for walking, cycling, public transport, uh, cars, freight. Um, I have that privilege of being able to join the dots or try to join the dots within the council. I came to Edinburgh in 2004 to do my master's degree um, for one year. And I stayed because look at these pictures. I mean, Edinburgh is an amazing, magical, beautiful city. Um, and it's impossible not to fall in love with Edinburgh. Uh, next slide, please. But like so many cities, and I know John's illustrated some of the issues at, you know, at the micro level, but at the macro level, Edinburgh is facing some real, real challenges. And one of the things that we, we're aiming to do in, in the council and you know with our city partners is to really face up to these challenges, acknowledge the problems that we have, and then look ahead to, uh, to our future streets and what we can, um, how we can um, you know, transform our streets and our places to truly embed uh, the principles of, of people, place and movement uh, in, in our city. So here are some examples of our city center. You know, I don't need to say much more than what these images, they speak for themselves. These are capital streets and what should be absolute joy to, to be uh, traversing through, to travel to, um, instead uh, vehicle dominated, not fun, to be, not fun to be there at the moment. Um, how are we dealing with this? Um, a couple of years ago, three interrelated strategies were approved by city leaders. So that's a city mobility plan, our climate strategy, and the 20 minute neighborhood strategy. And in each of these, and each of the action plans that sit underneath them, we as a council have reiterated our ambition and our um, commitment for that transformational change in our streets, where we reinforce the sustainable transport hierarchy, walking and wheeling at the very top. And last summer, we had a citywide consultation on what we call, as I said, the circulation plan. Um, and alongside that, the different action plans that all come together to form that, that holistic lens of our streets. So that's active travel, air quality, public transport, parking, biodiversity, all of that working together to give us that holistic lens of what Robert said, that system change that, that we need to see in our streets. The active travel action plan, we've costed at about 800 million to 1.2 billion pounds in Edinburgh. So it's not, you know, we can continue to tinker around our, our streets or if you want that transformational change, this is the kind of change that we're looking at. Um, and it includes big capital projects and capital investment, you know, from bridges to junction redesign to a fully segregated, a safe uh, cycle network. But alongside that, we went out to consultation on smaller, smaller things, smaller interventions, which I think are equally transformational. So drop curb program, where we have 17,000 drop curbs and accompanying tactile paving, uh, implementing and enforcing the pavement ban, which is due to come in, uh, in the next couple of weeks in, in Edinburgh, decluttering our pavements, providing places to rest, better crossings, and increasing opportunities for people to cross the street. 
Uh, next slide, please. And no surprises here whatsoever. It's a snapshot of um, what people said in the consultation. People want better crossings. 30% of respondents to the consultation said that limited crossing opportunities had a negative impact on how the family feel about moving around while walking, wheeling, or cycling in the area. Next slide, please. And even now, we have um, a real unmet demand for crossings in Edinburgh. Each year, we receive far greater number of requests for pedestrian crossings than we can build. We had 114 requests last um, over the past 18 months, and we have a waiting list that goes on to 2030. So status quo is just not working, and we need to make sure that we are able to take all of this into account, what people want in, in what we're doing going forward. Um, next slide, please. So again, I'll rattle through these very quickly. You know, you've seen other uh, other presenter slides. We're doing similar things, footway build outs, race tables, refuge islands. Uh, John uh, showed some pictures of, you know, uh, build outs that we're doing, uh, some temporary work that we're doing to start to, uh, you know, in advance of permanent infrastructure that can be built in. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, ran a learning event that Robert very kindly uh, came along to City of Edinburgh Council for our for our teams for my colleagues to make sure that we are you know right at the cutting edge of what needs done. Some very quick examples of um, what we're doing. This is a street in Edinburgh where we we're incorporating public realm improvements as well. So uh, you can see we've got trees, um, benches to create a more pleasant space, and really you know putting drop cups back in. So nothing you know, groundbreaking, but things that are starting to take shape and make it easier for people to cross. Next slide, please. Um, this is our city centre west to east link, which is our big, uh, the first of our big capital active travel schemes that connects the west of the city to the city centre. And over here, we've got, you know, as you can see, there's continuous footways. And again, taking into account what Robert said, looking at the traffic volumes that are coming in through our side streets, the traffic volumes, as you can see on that main street there, so token crossings, tiger crossings, parallel crossings, advanced cycle stop lines, contraflow cycle provision, race table entrances at side roads. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, we, we're doing all of this. We're putting the infrastructure in, but you can't do all of that without the necessary kind of, uh, you know, alignment with the behavior change and culture change that needs to happen. You know, we've talked earlier about worries that people have, especially with um, disabled communities who you know, who, who are not quite sure how to navigate these changes in our streets. Uh, our comms team produced a video uh, showing how to use these new junctions, um, footways, um, you know, and, and we're starting to really ramp up the communication around how we need to change our streets, why we need to change our streets, what we're doing, and how we use them. Uh, we've set up yesterday at committee, there was, um, the city has approved the setting up of an accessibility commission so it's an independent commission that sits, um, that scrutinizes the work that we do and that guides us in, in some of these tricky questions that we have to navigate if we have to make our city inclusive and safe for everybody. Um, last slide, I just wanted to end by saying that we are very keen uh, to explore local zebras. Council has instructed us as officers to go away, work with Transport Scotland, look at pilot projects. We've got a couple in the pipeline. Um, so very, very excited and very keen to incorporate all of these different measures, but set very firmly within that transformational change that, that is required, that system change that's required for us to, um, to make Edinburgh as, as inclusive, as resilient, as um, carbon neutral as, as possible. I'll stop here. Um, I don't know if I've gone over my time. Sorry, John, but really look forward to the conversation and look forward to learning from everyone as well, because that's what I'm here for. Thank you. No, you, Thank you. No, you didn't go over your time, Daisy, but we are together over the time that we have had. So if all the speakers would like to put their um, cameras and switch themselves back on. Um, just so you know, as I said right at the outset, we're obviously shorter at time than we hope we might be, but I didn't want to mm -hmm. cut into any of those speakers, other than Brian, um, uh, <laughs> just because um, it's it's good to hear what the different perspectives we've got. Um, we've had over 150 questions, if you count the ones that came beforehand, and uh, I, I noticed that of, you know 850 people were here as well. It's an extraordinary number, of, and we can't do justice to all of that. So what I'm going to do is try and pick the bones out, and I won't name any of the questioners, uh, of some of the biggest questions, I think. And Daisy, I think I'd like to start with you, but also it will um, apply to you, Chris, as well, which is there's a, it's a huge issue uh, and the cost of it all. 
So in your different ways, I suppose, Chris, in terms of the experience that, that you have had and just how much these things cost when you're doing that kind of comprehensive reconstruction. But Daisy, um, if I can start with you, but then Chris, if you'll pitch in, which is, as, as you said, you've got 17,000 junctions where there isn't you know, some base, the basic provision. How do you propose to go about that? Um, you know, as it comes back to what I said at the beginning, it's hidden in plain sight. There are so many of them. Um, and that's the first time I've ever heard that number. What is your, what can be the strategy for that kind of level of change? Thanks, John. It's not easy. And, you know, anyone working in local government or, or national government for that matter knows the resource pressures that we all, that we're all facing collectively. What we're trying to do is make, A, make the money go further. So as much as possible, look at that whole street, uh, whole street, um, approach where you know if you're doing something on the street, do it all at once. So you know, making money go further and, and faster. Second one is looking at a program. So the drop curves that you mentioned, you know, at the moment, you know, we've got as and when work happens on streets, whether it's maintenance or capital work, drop curves get put in through projects. But if it comes up as a program, you know, the scale of what needs done, then you know, we can go to Transport Scotland or different funding bodies and say, look, this is what we need, this is the change that we need. And then that becomes a program that can be funded and, and delivered as as a, as as one, which helps in resourcing and helps us as as a council to deliver. So a couple of things there in terms of how we are approaching it here. Okay, and Chris, obviously it costs a lot. Did you think, or have you thought of doing <clears throat> things differently? Yeah, I mean they do cost a lot of money. I think you know Wolfram Forest were extremely fortunate to be given many, you know, awarded Mini Holland funding, which was you know probably the first time in history in London that kind of level of money was given to one borough to go off and do things, and that obviously allowed a lot of things that we hadn't done previously. Um, move forward, our, our view is it's Wolfram Forest view is it's, it's building that in, accepting that if you want to do this stuff, it does cost money. Maybe you just need to frame your delivery programs without trying to you know accept delivering. A small number of schemes but maybe bigger ones or more comprehensive ones it's then do you have other programs running in parallel that look to do some of those and i hate the term quicker wins but you know there's more like kind of local accessibility issues until such time you can then come along as part of a major project and redesign the street kind of end to end so i think it's acceptance really that that's the way you know, these things cost money and and how you and how you make the case and get the funding to enable that so Thanks, Chris. I should just say that we're doing some work with Glasgow at the moment where one of our approaches to this is to take a whole kind of estate approach to this and just say, well, that's a capital scheme. I think that's that danger. Yeah. And that's about prioritisation, you know, and walking, cycling. That's the top of our uh, there are top of our priorities. So actually, why don't we prioritise doing these all day, every day kind of area wide schemes rather than perhaps some other types of big scheme that we might otherwise think of doing? Brian, oh, if I can turn to you. Around, sorry, yes, Daisy. Yeah, no, no. Around the cost of not doing it as well. And yeah. I think that needs to be factored in. Yeah, although we're so unused to making that kind of case as it were. Brian, just a particular question. Some people talk about costs as well, on, and I'll come on to some other questions about the zebras. Did you look whether it's at AT or when you were at Manchester previously about the relative cost of uh, introducing simple zebras relative to comprehensive con reconstruction? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the paint is cheap bit of it. We even looked at like a cheaper ways of doing like tactile as well with like a like companies like Tac Grid where you can put plastic down and paint over it and get that kind of effect. So, like, how could we do a mass rollout quickly? So yeah, it was like a the the difference between doing like a full zebra or signals or side road entries or, or continuous footways depending on the the junction you're looking at. You're looking like sixty, seventy plus grand to do that where it can be like four or five to do a zebra in the cheapest way it's obviously lots of caveats with costs and, and framework yeah. but it was like a, an order of magnitude cheaper and i know uh great manchester still want to roll things out on mass when they get the nod and it does give you that option when things are cheaper but I, i'm definitely with chris as well that rolling out that kind of major project cementing it all in doing it is great but okay. it's, it's always been hard to make the case for investment on local streets. And that's where most of the uh, the walking's happening. So I think we have got like a cheap solution there. Thanks. On the zebra side of things, Brian, could you just very quickly say, if I, you probably said it before, but just summarise when, I mean, all right, following wind, when might there be authorization to do simple zebras? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's in always this, difficult in the government to say an exact date, but we do know that the, the TSRGD is up for review. And that's the yeah. the mechanism for getting these things approved. 
we think there's an overwhelming case to make them approved. So we're just like, a, at the moment, just like satisfying ourselves that we know when these things are going to be used and where they're appropriate and what the surrounding conditions are, all the stuff that the, the fellow panellists are, will be asked for advice on that. And we want to gather our thoughts on that. So we're, we're recommending these things in the right places. So when that document's done, albeit yeah. like, a, if you remember back to the last one, and I know you will, because I, yes. I know I do, the, the word like a pre-documents like signing the way that came out saying, hey, we think we're heading in this direction. So maybe we'll issue something like that. At the moment, we're tied up with uh, lots of legislation around the future transport bill and East Kids and the rest, but it's all part of that package. So I've given a suitably uh, like a vague answer there. No, when no, it comes, that's, but we do that's want absolutely to fine. As, as a classic civil <laughs> servant, servant, Brian, I would expect it, nothing less. Barty, well, um, in Cardiff, um, so what 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 happens to them now? You've done this research; they're still there. What are their plans? And in Wales, more broadly, do you know, in terms of simple zebras? No, not the most updated one. The last one was we really spoke was about putting up, um, getting the approvals to put the the simple crossings in place. And I don't think I'm not sure what the progress is there yet. Right, they're probably Sorry. thinking of a lot of. <laughs> A lot of focus on 20 mile an hour things at the moment, I imagine, over there. Yeah. And there was a detailed question, which I don't know if you know. Was there any um, before and after collision analysis for these sites? Do you know if that's been done? No, no, not for this trial. We did not look at those. OK. It was just a two week observation. Yeah. Thanks very much. There's another broad issue as well, which has come up a number of times. And I asked Jonathan if you can answer this first, but also, Robert, I'd be interested in your take, which is the classic one of Tactiles or no tactiles? How does that, you know, wh when do you think that, um, sorry, if Chris, sorry, Robert, if you can answer that first. And also, Chris, if you could just come back in and what your experience is. Sorry, Jonathan, I've got a separate question for you. Um, so can you have tactile paving with continuous footways, so to speak? And OK, so I can't answer that in the time we have because <laughs> everybody will have in their mind something different when we talk about a continuous footway. Um, so if you want to admit the, the, you know the image i think i'd like to leave people with would be to think about a private driveway so start with a private driveway somebody drives in and out once a day or twice a day um do we want tactile paving there and broadly no we don't because once you start doing that everywhere the whole street becomes very confusing because then the whole street becomes a, a sea of tactile paving so start from there and then start saying okay what if that gets a bit bigger what if it gets a bit wider? What if the traffic levels across that get a bit a bit stronger? At what point do we want to do what? And at a certain point, you know, things are going to get complicated. And at that point, things are going to break down and maybe we don't have pedestrian priority. But perhaps at that point, actually, we no longer want a continuous footway. We want something else. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, I think that's all the answer I'm going to try and give at the moment. It's a very complicated issue. And do we or do we not want tactile paving at continuous footways? It's not that question can't be answered without getting into the detail. And if I can uh, summarize some of my understanding from the research as well, is when you've got what you have called a real continuous footway, the definition of that is that you would not need tactile paving in a sense. And yeah, you're, we're certainly heading towards something like that. Again, it's still even then more com more complicated because at that point we start to have to think about some other issues that are not about safety and priority. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're about how does somebody who is blind or partially sighted find their way across a space which becomes, to some extent, an open space. Yeah, we've we've started to tackle that. What we've actually said, the, the important thing we've said is that this requires some national coordinated work that, you know, it's this should not be being left to individual designers to say, well, I'm going to try this and I'm going to try that. That's not yeah. helping and is a, is, is a bad approach. And I think what you've hinted at there as well about the idea of there being some kind of thresholds, again, a number of questions about this, when to, when not to, I, that would be very helpful. Chris, just on the tactiles issue, that's obviously something I'm sure you've heard about and have thought yeah. about in, in Walsham Forest. How did that go? Yeah, I think, you know, well, Forest, there was a, and this predates my time there, just a conscious decision to not put tactiles in. You know, as I said, it's, very, as Robert said, a very complex and subjective matter. So rightly or wrongly, it was feeling that, um, you know, that we were creating side streets with, very low flows and we didn't say threshold but typically 250 to 500 vehicles a day maximum um that wanted to remove all of that infrastructure that typically typically you know make people see as a road and and maybe the the kind of subconscious priority or lack of priority that gives different users so the, the from day one it was kind of get rid of all that 
and then we think we can mitigate you know the other factors in terms of reducing vehicle speeds you know and, and stuff like that so I think moving forward, I'm really kind of keen to kind of go through the living streets work and and uh, you know, other bits of research and see whether um, you know we need to kind of take a, a review on that. But um, I think for now we will continue um, on the basis that we won't put them in where low you know, low flows are achieved. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, just quickly, you I think you raised a really interesting point, but a number of questions raised as well, which is if some, it actually goes back to the, I think it was a New Zealand example, sorry, Australian example, which yeah. is some have, some don't, in terms of simple zebras. Uh, you got any thoughts about that? About So where do we move from that? Because that seems like a fairly obvious one, which is if we get used to seeing zebras, do, do drivers think they don't have to turn where there aren't any zebras? What, what would your take be on that? Well, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a challenge. I think we need to look at some some of the questioning that has come in in the form of uh, education. We brought out the highway code with, with with very little education, so that's that that's the context that we 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 chose for whatever um, we chose for whatever reason. I, I think my general answer would be that whatever we have, um, our regulation and our design should should uh, complement one one another if we have des designs that intuitively say to do something that is contrary to uh, our regulations it's 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 problem problematic so i think all de all designs um yeah. all, all side streets should be be backing up our, our, our regulations and intuitively um supporting our regulations but we we do need to consider networks as uh, other people have uh, have talked about and if we're doing something in one part of the city and something totally different in another part of the city that's obviously going to be confusing to to all street users yeah yeah so quickly throwing back to you on that brian as well it seems to me and again a number of questions about this is the whole idea of with the tsrgd changes we're doing this sort of stuff there really does seem to be and with the highway code a real need for government to take hold of and say let, let's get some proper education about this things are changing side streets are like this is this is what we're expecting can you anticipate that that would be something would follow on from the TSRGD rather than we'll just do some technical work in a corner here that the general public will never know about but actually a proper sort of comms campaign really yeah, well, this is kind of the space that Active Travel in exists in, like, a, a colleagues in the Department of Transport set the regulations, and they go, well, there's the regulation. But it's difficult for the people that set the regulations to then say, how do you interpret it in different designs? They kind of leave that up to the highway authorities as the highway authorities, but we exist in a space where if highway authorities want some clarity, we can get some best practice, we can put some guidance together, and we can work on that, and it is on our list of things to address. Um, so uh, the, the more people that ask us to do that across England, the more we will put some guidance together and we can work in that space and we can see it from the local authority perspective. So, Sorry, are, are you inviting delegates to write into Active Travel England to suggest this should be done? Yeah. And Sorry, even with, like, Sorry did missing, I say that? Yeah, even with the missing questions that we're not going to ask, I'm quite happy to contact activetravelengland.gov.uk. I'll make all my team who are very stretched little bit matter but yeah this is what we exist for we exist to, to work in the space and to help local authorities find a way to introduce regulations and changes and and as robin said it's it's a continuum we're like a continuous yeah. footway through to through zebra there are ways already of getting the the benefits and the desire you want and to get that clear priority and um, so we're, we're happy to advise people on that so yes, lovely. That I'm really conscious that we're at the end of it now, and I'm sorry that that we haven't been able to do justice to all the questions and stuff like that. I suppose there's just two things I can say on that. One is, we'll, as, as Brian has said, do feel free um, to to contact individuals. You will find a lot of information about what they've done. The slides will be available afterwards. Um, uh, so let's try and keep that conversation going. There's obviously the the, the conference that I mentioned as well. We can go into this more detail. Um, by all means, get in touch uh, through um, the the, uh, the organisation to ask further questions. I've just got one final slide, um, which I'd like to show if that's all right. Um, this is something I did beforehand, and, and I've, it's uh, Side Streets Junction's blueprint question mark, because I hadn't listened to any of the presentations I knew it was coming, and also because maybe it's not in any case, but just some sort of summary thoughts. If you can just keep uh, tapping down, Mark. So this is my first thing, which is that we've got to change how these junctions look in the first place, whether we're going to go for continuous footways or whether we're going to go for simple zebras or whatever, or whether we're going to do nothing else. But we need to do this because uh, we need to have shorter crossing distance and reduced turning speeds. My personal take, this has been covered by a couple of questions, but something else is we need to raise them all as well. 
And that's where the, po po the possibility of even with having simple zebras, we're still going to be talking about reconstruction. And the reason we need to do that is I think it's far better for all users. We can go straight across rather than down and up and up and down. And, and notwithstanding the fact that actually we know we have problems when we, when we drop, we don't get the drops right. The, the drop shifts slightly over time. It gets ponded and all that sort of stuff. The next thing, we do need to have blister paving on both sides of the crossing. Other than possibly in those examples that um, Robert was talking about, where it's so low, like the kind of driveway things or those real continuous footways. My personal take is that you could have a color optional for that, and that could be about contextual issues. Um, questions were raised about speed as well. What do you do if you're turning off 40 mile an hour? My suggestion is you probably don't do it. Um, if the main road is 30 or 20, we can do that. We do need to make sure that, that, that we have the speed as slow as possible. The issue about shunts as well, I think, is really important. A number of questions were about people being worried about shunts. Frankly, I don't care too much about shunts. I do care about people getting knocked down when they're walking or wheeling or cycling across a junction. We'll get used to it. And But nevertheless, of course, if you've got lower speeds, there was one, uh, quickly, I'll touch on that. And it goes back to my first one about tightening up the radii. A lot of questions here. What about refuse vehicles? What about ambulances? What about HGVs and so forth? Well, Brian mentioned the context issues. So did Robert. My personal take is there's, a, there's some issues about construction there and how we need to might need to protect the corners vehicles can turn out into the other lane to turn left and we shouldn't be designing our junctions around the needs of a tiny number of vehicles in certain contexts we may feel that actually we can't do too much about it because of the specific demands for a large number of those vehicles a curb build outs are another thing you might do my take would then be from that basic thing of let's tighten it up and raise the crossing shove a zebra off it on it if we can obviously issues about that we've discussed about whether they all have some don't have and then almost as your your ideal solution and go for um continuous foot real continuous footways as, as as robert's research describes them where that cost is justified and that's probably to do with local bill environment quality or, or, or something like that where you don't want to load a street full of uh, of stripy black and white lines but the starting point is we need to rethink how we need to focus on and i think a real campaign to think that this is not good enough the way that our side street junctions are at the moment. Um, we really need to deal with that as a first point, tighten them up, raise those crossings, and let's see what more we can do in due course. I'm sorry it's been such a whistle-stop tour, um, but thank you for joining us. Um, amazing 850 people were here of the 1,200 signups. Do sign up for the, the, the conference if you can make it. There you go. And um, uh, take, in, take all the information that will come your way in due course in terms of the links to the research that we've had um, and, uh, and, and have a look at that. Ask further questions of people who are on this, uh, on this call. And um, I wish you very well in your endeavours to making side streets much better for people to walk, wheel and cycle across. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to Philando for putting this on. And um, I wish you well in your day jobs. Cheerio.